The engineer is arguably the oldest job in human history. Before there were farmers nurturing and harvesting crops, someone had to figure out how farming worked in the first place. Nowadays, engineering is often associated with industry and metal machinery, but at its core, engineering is just designing something to solve a problem. One might argue that nearly every job in some way requires engineering of some kind. It is a position that's inseparable from life itself. So, of course, it's been replicated numerous times in pop culture. The engineer archetype is typically one with a lot of intelligence, but not always a solid reputation. With great power comes great responsibility, and for every successful engineer in a story, there's another engineer that used his intellect unwisely to assist the antagonist of the plot. These ill-advised decisions may seem ridiculous to us mere mortals, but we can't know what it's like to wield the power of the engineer. Imagine if you understood the mechanics and sciences of life to such a degree that finding the solution to every problem was as easy as thinking about it hard enough. This is the idealized engineer, the one every kid dreams of being when they start using Legos for the first time. The ultimate control of the world around you. Eventually, the Legos those kids were building with turned into Minecraft blocks. Video games have become an outlet for expressing creativity and ingenuity. People have poured thousands of hours into figuring out the mechanics of virtual worlds, and then went on to use that knowledge in the real world. Imagine the effort and skill required to be this proficient at something. But some people don't have time for that. Who cares about the work and passion required to be an engineer? What matters is the power, the influence. Imagine if you could build a complex machine in seconds, just from the push of a key. Out of all of the games to portray engineering, two have stood out above the rest as the premier examples of what it truly feels like to wield the mighty wrench. Team Fortress 2 and Deep Rock Galactic. These two engineers may share the same title, but they are far from the same person. They walk the same road, but one is made to avoid conflict, and one is made to pursue it. Their sentries by their sides, they will battle it out to assure their team is victorious. This is what it means to be an engineer. Team Fortress 2 is a competitive class-based movement-focused shooter released in 2007. It has nine classes, each with their own advantages and drawbacks. One of these classes is the Engineer, a rambunctious Texan with a knack for inventing helpful machines to assist his fellow mercenaries. Visually, he resembles a construction worker, but in personality he's closer to a mad scientist. However, at heart, TF2's Engineer is a munitions expert, someone who handles artillery and designs weapons built to give his side an advantage in war. In most TF2 matches, you play in a chaotic battle against a team of other players. The gameplay is very unpredictable and hectic, as both teams scramble to try and find ways to prevent the other one from accomplishing their goals. As an engineer, your main mode of assistance is your buildings, those being your teleporters, dispenser, and sentry. Though you also have access to a shotgun and a pistol for short and mid-range self-defense, respectively. Your primary job is to place your buildings in defensible positions that boost the effectiveness of your team and mitigate the effectiveness of the enemy. The most effective way to do this is by utilizing your sentry, which outputs massive damage and covers a huge area. Anyone who gets even remotely close to it is getting melted by bullets. Not to mention, the sentry can be upgraded twice through two different tiers of destructive potential. The level 1 sentry is deadly enough, but a level 3 sentry often requires a full offensive push from the other team in order to be put down effectively. The sentry is only as strong as the engineer defending it, though, as there are easy ways to exploit its targeting systems if the engineer isn't paying attention. As with real life, it is important for the engineer to understand the weaknesses of their design and compensate for them adequately. Your inventions aren't perfect, and must be managed closely and handled with care. This is why the stock engineer playstyle is very, very passive. The time required for buildings to be built is often too long to allow for an engineer to build aggressively near the enemy team. All of the buildings are also incredibly fragile, and are often being attacked by direct frontal fire or by flanking spies. These two drawbacks are what incentivize the TF2 engineer to build his buildings away from direct fire, and wait for the fight to come to him. 
This is why new engineers often end up placing all their buildings in one place, opting to turtle instead of playing more dynamically. Though using your shotgun and pistol as an excuse to escape away from the enemy is often more effective in defending your buildings, it also requires more awareness, which new players don't typically have. The average engineer often relegates himself to the backline, acting passively for the majority of the game. The existence of the dispenser and teleporter assists this more defensive mentality. Both of these buildings are optimally placed in the backline of a fight, and must be maintained to prevent them from being sapped or shot. This requires the engineer to stay behind the front line, which reinforces the defensive playstyle that the class already establishes with its stock set of weapons. Furthermore, the default sentry requires upgrades to be fully effective. This upgrading process utilizes metal, a resource exclusive to the engineer, that can be refilled through ammo packs and resupply cabinets. This means that TF2's engineer has to spend more time on managing his sentry just to get it upgraded. It's an investment to build a sentry, and the destruction of it is often a massive setback for the engineer involved. Defending the sentry can often prevent the engineer from leaving his nest, which forces the NG to play more defensive and passively. Of course, this inclination towards slow, methodical defense can be offset by unlockable weapons such as the Gunslinger, the Frontier Justice, or the Wrangler. All of these weapons allow for TF2's engineer to break away from his stationary, passive playstyle. However, even with these options, it's still often suboptimal to play too aggressively. An NG playing too offensively will likely leave their team wide open for an attack, assuming they don't have a more passive NG playing in the back line to cover the overextending Texan that's attempting to take on the enemy team with a shotgun and a dream. Even with the Gunslinger, often cited as the most aggressive engineer weapon, its benefits are only present in short bursts of battle or one-on-one -on -one situations due to the smaller health pool of the mini sentries created by the weapon. At some point, every NG will be forced to adhere to the more passive playstyle incentivized by the game itself, assuming the other team is at the very least competent. That isn't to say the optimal way to play Engineer is to build a level 3 sentry and then just do nothing for the rest of the game. The best TF2 NGs find a hybrid between offense and defense, but the offense being employed is almost always to boost their defensive hold or increase the area denial being offered by their sentry. The power being harnessed by TF2's Engineer is one of control and influence, and the game rewards players who understand the limits of both themselves and their buildings. If a player tries taking on the enemy team with their shotgun and pistol alone, they will quickly learn the cost of a lack of planning and thought. Players who enjoy the TF2 Engineer's style of gameplay are likely decisive and strategic, and will benefit from an inclination to plan out every move mindfully. One of the most satisfying parts of playing Engineer is experimenting with new spots to place each building in order to maximize their defensive output. Even if your unorthodox sentry spot doesn't work, you just take the design you have, tweak it, and update it. That's what engineers do after all. Thinking outside the box and discovering new solutions to the problems laid out in front of you is what being an engineer is all about. Well, among other things. Sometimes your goal as an engineer isn't to invent new solutions to existing problems, but to make the old solutions even better than they were before. Meet Deep Rock Galactic's engineer. If TF2's engineer is a munitions expert, then DRG's wrench-wielding dwarf represents a true-to-form civil engineer. His entire purpose is to boost the effectiveness of his team by making their jobs easier and giving them less to worry about. Accurate to the name, the engineer handles and strengthens the infrastructure of the team by offering constant combat-based and objective-centric support. Deep Rock Galactic's engineer is much more offensively inclined, due largely to the change in goal when compared to TF2. In DRG, your primary focus is on completing an objective, whether that be gathering gemstones, mining materials, defeating a couple of dreadnoughts, or escorting a big drill to break open an even bigger geode. The only thing standing in the way of your team accomplishing its goal is the swarms of enemies, known as glyphids, that plague each procedurally generated cave you enter. The shift from PvP gameplay toward PvE gameplay allows for the engineer to rely on more predictable patterns. Incoming waves will always get a voice line from Mission Control, your man in the chair during each mission. The Glyphic Grunts are here. Let's show them our special handshake, team. As such, it's not necessary for the engineer to be too careful or slow moving, since they can predict a lot of what's going to happen in advance and plan their movements accordingly. Deep Rock Galactic rewards constantly being on your toes, as the mission will get progressively more difficult the longer you're in the cave. Not to mention, you have a limited supply of ammo, so it's unwise to linger in one place for too long. Compared to TF2's engineer, DRG's gameplay facilitates its engineer being much more active, which is compounded by the way it handles its sentries. 
As stock engineer, you were given not one, but two sentries to handle and take care of. These sentries are non-upgradable, unlike your TF2 counterpart, and there aren't any other buildings to handle or maintain. All you have is your two sentries. That's it. These sentries take four seconds to construct, but must be built manually by holding down the E key, as opposed to the automatic construction that TF2's sentries have. They also can't be destroyed, allowing for DRG's engineer to stay away from his sentries for longer periods of time than his TF2 counterpart. These differences all allow for the engineer to be more mobile and independent, which assists him greatly in accomplishing his primary goal, helping his team. While certain engineers in real life are very hands-off, creating blueprints and plans for their peers to enact, there's also several engineering jobs that require the engineer to get his hands dirty. DRG's engineer is certainly an instance of the latter. His sentries are built to lessen the stress of incoming enemy waves by thinning them out, making them easier to deal with for the rest of the team. Not to mention, the stock engineer is also equipped with a shotgun and a grenade launcher for handling single strong targets and groups of weak enemies respectively. The engineer has everything he could ever need to deal with his own battles in combat. But what about handling the objective? Well, no engineer leaves home without his tools, and this engineer is equipped with one of the most versatile Swiss army knives in the entire game, his platform gun. All three of the other classes in Deep Rock Galactic have movement abilities that are useful for manipulating the terrain in order to better complete the mission as fast as possible. Engineer's equivalent is the platform gun, a gun that attaches a small platform to whatever surface it hits. This platform can only be destroyed with pickaxe strikes or explosives. The platform gun automatically makes Engineer at least twice as helpful to his team, as well as making him better independently at completing nearly every objective in the entire game. In situations where Scout or Gunner need to reach somewhere with their grappling abilities and can't find a place to attach them, Engineer is there to give them a platform and allow them to reach somewhere that they couldn't before. The platform gun is the immediate solution. Not to mention, it allows the Engineer himself to do his best Minecraft speedrunner impression, placing platforms just under his feet mid-jump. This gives him some of the fastest continuous movement in the entire game, as well as the ability to reposition himself and his team nearly at will. All of this requires active, continuous input from the player. Unlike TF2's Engineer, Deep Rock Galactic's Engineer doesn't facilitate playing it safe. You are constantly rewarded for moving and getting your job done as quickly and efficiently as possible. While TF2 often promotes the Engineer to think outside of the box more, Deep Rock Galactic gives the player relatively straightforward ways of accomplishing each goal and rewards the player for their speed and proficiency in doing so. The power harnessed by Deep Rock Galactic's Engineer is one of efficiency, acting as the oil that keeps his team active and effective. Players that choose to play this variant of Engineer are likely fast-thinking and quick-witted, always moving and always looking for ways to optimize their performance. Weirdly enough, that's almost the exact opposite of TF2's Engineer, who is much more slow and methodical in comparison. Why is that? Growing up, it's common for native English speakers to be taught about homophones, or two words that sound the same, yet have different meanings. Words like flea, or creek, or there, all words that sound identical and yet have variants that aren't the same at all. However, most don't know about the homophone's distant cousin, the homograph. These are the words that look the same, yet have a different meaning. This category includes every name and title in any language. Not all stands are comic book creators. Every Donald isn't a duck. Just because both of these characters are engineers doesn't make them the same. The titles we ascribe to various positions are often used as a catch-all term to describe them in the shorthand. People call things mid all the time, but often refuse to define what they actually mean by that. It's uncommon to find someone, especially online, that makes time for nuance and specificity when discussing things. You might assume that someone who likes this engineer might also like playing as this engineer, but that's just not how language, or life in general, works. Though these two builder men may seem similar on the surface, when you really break down their game plans, surroundings, objectives, and goals, you begin to realize they're almost entirely different characters. While one is built around preparation, planning, and management, the other is built around efficiency and speed. Yet, despite these differences, both of them almost perfectly encapsulate what it means to be an engineer. They are two sides of the same word, defining what an engineer represents for themselves and embodying their interpretation. Though they share the same title, they are far from the same person. This dilemma is often present with how we, as humans, define ourselves, our names. Often people see their names as something that's been put upon them, something they feel the need to live up to. 
They let their name define who they are, rather than defining it themselves. People break out of this in many ways, such as changing their name, going by a nickname, or keeping their name in hopes of redefining it for themselves and for others. Taking back one's name is one of the most satisfying and rewarding things that a lot of people accomplish in their life. It's a point of pride that they were able to overcome the expectations put on them by the name they were given. However, it's important to recognize that, to others, actions speak infinitely louder than anything shouted during a roll call. It doesn't matter what words you're called if you never define what it means. Despite these two engineers sharing the same title, the differences in their actions were strong enough to separate them past their shared name. They each defined who they were by their actions, not letting any preconceived notions get in the way of what kind of engineer they were going to be. Perhaps if we did the same with our names, our actions could engineer ourselves into people defined not by the words that we're known by, but by the actions that have built us into who we are.